You're listening to the Beans and Dice podcast, a podcast about how we game. Uh, next one on my list, uh, this is, again, one I had played before. Uh, it was another one Rob said he was interested in. Uh, he and I and Nick played. It was Inish, I-N-I-S. Um, I may have an, an elevated opinion of this game based on personal history. So Inish is set in Ireland. It's like the, the settling of Ireland. Inish means I- island in Gaelic. And my wife and I actually went on our honeymoon on an island called Inish Moor. So oh. it was the original reason, reason that I picked up this game after I played it one time. And then right whenever I first got it years ago, uh, it doesn't get cold very often in Louisiana. And so there was a freeze one year and we were off of work for a couple of days and we played this game just nonstop, almost through the night. So it, it's got a special place in my heart for a couple of reasons. But anyway, it, it's a, uh, do you it's own this copy? Game. Yeah, I, I own the game. Who's yeah. your, who's the, who's the publisher for your version? Uh, I think it's Matago. 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 Christian think, Martinez, yeah, designer. It, yeah. designer. Christian Martinez, yeah. So it's a drafting game, but what I like about it is that it's a very small number of cards that get recycled over and over again. So in a two- and three-player game, it's um, 12, 13 cards, and in a four-player four game, it's 17 cards. So it's not – at least once you know the cards, you look at it, you see the picture, and you're like, oh, I do or I don't want that one. It's not like Terraforming Mars where you got to stack this big – so in my opinion, it's quick. And then there are different. Uh, there are three different victory conditions. Um, have six of this, have six of this, or have six of this. What's cool about it is um, you can get this resource called a deed, as many as you want, and they decrease the requisite number that you have to have for each victory condition. So if I have a deed, I only have to get five of whatever, you know. And then the last thing I like is, in order to win, you have to declare, "Hey, I'm about to win." Pretty much like saying check. It's like in, Uno. In chat. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, kind of, yeah. You have to grab what's called a pretender token. And so it alerts everybody else like, oh, wow, if I didn't notice that, because the victory conditions aren't always super evident. But if I'm using one of those Ds to cash in for the pretender token and then somebody does something to where I no longer have the victory condition, I've lost that deed now. So it's a little bit of a give and take. I don't know if it hit as well for Nick and, and Rob as, as for <laughs> me. I, I give this game probably a nine. It's one of my wow. favorites of all time. But again, I have those experiences tied into it. Sure. And that's what makes gaming good. It's not yeah. just the game itself. It's the people and your experiences you bring to the table. I don't know if you're going to have anything to say about Inish, Carlos. Uh, other than it's, it seems to me like a dudes on a map game, which has me interested in playing. I mean, there's little dudes on a map. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. This is a game that, I, I again, my experience is going to be a little uh, on the other side. Um, this is a game I think definitely benefits from multiple plays. So, again, having only played it once, I know, again, it's a, it's a well-liked game. This is a, one that pops up a lot. I, I've heard it for years, and I've, I've wanted to play it for years. I, I would say I was a little disappointed by my play. I, I think it's partially, again, uh, admittedly, my slow on the uptake. It, it takes me a little longer to, to grasp the general rules and to remember uh, the cards. And I, as you mentioned, this game is a huge benefit in knowing that small group of cards. How many? How, do you remember how many cards it is in the deck? It's like maybe 12 yeah, so cards. So with two or, and three players, there's 13, 13. And in four players, there's uh, 17. Oh, okay, so it does, uh, does scale a little bit. So with our game with 13 cards, I felt what we were playing was me, you, and Nick. Uh, Nick has a memory like almost nobody I've ever seen before. I think he had memorized all the cards in the first round. We were on the fourth or fifth round, and I was still seeing cards being like, oh, oh, I, I, I probably have had that card once or twice before, but I didn't read exactly what it did, and I didn't quite understand. And so I... Um, I would say I was getting creamed in this game, but to be honest, I don't really feel like I was getting creamed. I think at the end of the game, I was only uh, one or two regions away from where I needed to be until Nick started pushing me out of, of the spots. But um, I don't know. I, I felt like I was fighting an uphill battle. I, I didn't quite know what was going on until we were two-thirds of the way through the game, and I, you know, Nick was taking those tokens and stuff and was kind of declaring that he was about to win, and I was like, oh, wow, you know, that was kind of quick. That uh, I uh, you know, I'm just kind of starting to get my head wrapped around this thing, and and now I feel like it's almost over. It, it took Nick a few extra rounds, and I think partially because he didn't know the game either. He'd mentioned in retrospect there was something he could have done like a round or two earlier that probably would have given him the win. And I know at the end you saw it coming. You told me you're like, I think you know we we are gonna have to do something about Nick really quick because otherwise he's got this thing wrapped up. But uh, I would say just from my one play. Uh, I, I would give it a six. I'd say I definitely would play it again, uh, but the six would be my rating just off the one play. I'd say it was okay. Uh, you know, again, I would. I think I'm going to have to be in the mood to play it again. I'd like to try it at four. Um, although I think the scaling is it's pretty better at four. Is it okay? Yeah, but yeah, unfortunately, a six. But again, one I'm definitely open to trying again. 
Cool. That's Inish. So what do you got up for us next, Carlos? Yeah, dudes on the map. I'm not surprised you didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I wasn't crazy about it, but it, it was okay. Well, let's keep the dudes on the map thing going. Uh, I At this point on Thursday, I got to uh, – we did get to play – the game that I had at home delivered to me as I left to Tampa from Tampa to Orlando. Yeah. So it was waiting for me at home. It's Clash of Cultures. This is the the re implementation of Clash of Cultures. Uh, so it's a 2021 release. This one's by WizKids Game is the version that I have. Uh, Clash of Cultures was originally published, I believe it was uh, here it is 2012. So you know, nine year old game already. Uh, it, it's been around for a while. The re-implementation really doesn't change a lot. Monumental Edition, yep. Right, Monumental Edition. What the Monumental Edition does is it brings in all those expansions that the original edition had. Yep. Uh, for example, the civilizations we played with, those aren't in the base game. The base mm. game, you don't get a civilization-specific faction. Ah, okay. Right. So it, it's... Not it was one of the expansions, the multiple expansions of different civs were put out. So in the base, you start out symmetrical. You don't, you're don't, you not asymmetric at all? Yeah, the base game oh, is just symmetrical. I might like that better, but go ahead. Really? Yeah, I think I would. I yeah. deal with meal. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's uh, Christian Markinson, published by WizKids Games. It's a two to four player game. Uh, it says 240 minutes, and I'm going to say you're going to use all of that <laughs> if sure. you use the basic rules. Yeah. Right. And the weight is pretty high. It's weighted at a 3.5. I would agree. Uh, individually each of these mechanisms in the game are not difficult it's when you put them all together in order to win is where people struggle uh, but it, it's a civ building game and it is the best civ building game i have played to date it is the most civ building game flavor and in execution that i've ever played and i really like civ building i like 4x this is also a 4x game uh, expand exploit exterminate and uh, explore. explore, explore, explore. Yep, yep, yep. Because explore is in there too. So all four X's are in this game. So a lot of four X games really don't have all four X's. Uh, this one has all four X's, and you're going to be given a civilization. So the game in the way that I would prefer you play it with the full game, you get a civilization that is so so themey to their civilization. Like the Romans are the Romans in this game. They beat up on barbarians and they move fast because they have roads. Right, the Celts are so Celt because the Celts are just like a bougie version of a barbarian. Like they're they're like a little more stepped up civilization of a barbarian. So they actually work with the NPC non-player character barbarians in the game to get their victory points. Uh, I think Dan played uh, the Indian faction, and they are very very non-aggressive, very theological focused, dogma focused, kind of moving. Their, their cultural uh, uh, influence out versus attacking. So it, it just it hit on so well with each of the different factions that were visible. Uh, you're going to enjoy this game if you like uh, games that have tech trees because this is the whole game itself is just a big tech tree. How do you, in what order do you tech out your civilization in order to begin getting those free actions? Because you're only getting three actions on a turn and each t- or each round, you're going to take a turn. Each turn, you can take three actions. How do you get techs that allow you to do things for cheaper, faster, and free? Uh, you're, you're going to explore because all the tiles are going to be face down. You don't know what's in front of you. You don't know what's between you and your opponents. So you begin exploring and revealing those tiles. It's going to uh, it's going to change the game every time. Because for example, my first play of it with Mitch, I had nothing but C tile between myself. And the other half of the board, with the exception of one space that allowed for land movement between me and the other two players, William and Mitch, were on the other side. So I felt free to just focus on passive things like uh, building tech, building buildings, you know, advancing my civilization peacefully, while watching those two have to passively, aggressively uh, look at each other and build up their forces to defend themselves. I didn't have to fight that fight. But even though that was different in how I played my game and those two played their game, our scores were so close. I mean, it just it showed me that even if you do have the freedom of movement, it all depends on how you take your actions, you know, what you do. I ended up winning that game, but I was at 38 and a half points where Mitch was at 35 points. We're only talking three and a half points difference between two completely different setups for players. So it kept it very tight. 
Well, I don't know how much you wanted to get into that. There was a pretty major rule mistake, I understand, that was played in that first game, which actually would really affect, I think, the isolationism part. That right, because the barbarians would have come out heavier. Right. It would have right. made me fight barbarians had right. we understood that aspect of the game, which that one came up fine in my other plays, because I played this thing, I think, three times right. during the con. When the barbarians start coming out, you're really never alone. Right. right. You draw barbarians, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming for you. But yeah. they're not quite as hard to beat as a sure, another player. As another player would be. Right. And because nobody likes barbarians, beating them up gives you gold. Sure. So you have a reason to send out a unit to try to go get an attack because you're going to get resources from picking on barbarians. Right. Uh, you're building wonders. To, uh, so part of the game is is getting to a place where you have enough resources and capital to spend on building these one of eight beautiful wonders that give you bonus points. You, the, the, one of the coolest parts is that the the non-aggressive way to influence others is influence of culture. So instead of attacking another person's city, you can use your culture and attempt to influence that city. What it does is it, it, it takes over one of that player's buildings in that city with your building color. So at the end of the game, you are now getting the points for that person's building that they're no longer getting because you're, you've been able to influence their culture. I think I aligned it to uh, almost like, you know, I grew, I grew up in, in Miami. It, it's like Little Havana, sure. right? It's, yeah. yeah, it's in it's in the U.S., but really, it's kind of like Cuba. Like yeah. the influence is so strong there that that goes to the Cuba player. If there was a Cuba civilization, not the U.S. player, so yeah. that's kind of how I likened it to. Uh, I can talk for hours yeah, on this say, game, this which a, I won't. This is a game, yeah, that we uh, we probably probably will at some point spend a whole episode on. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, I'll, I'll keep my let me let me get the the quick and okay, and, yes. and I'll wrap it up the yeah. play it with the fast variant. The fast okay. variant is yeah. I also played with that. Yeah. At two-player, it just makes a fun, fast, concise game in two hours, which gives you flavor of Civ building fast. Enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Robert, right. what did you think? Well, that was my biggest problem with the game. The, our, our, my only play of the game was uh, I, and it, I, probably my fault as much as any, but I, when we went into it, it was a four-player game, which is the maximum player count, I believe. And I had understood we were looking at a two- to three-hour experience. With the teach, I think I said four. Oh, so either way, but with the teach, it was well over five. So I, I think it was five and a half hours ish. Our first play there, and so I was really into it for about the first two, two and a half hours. Uh, partially, I know we've talked about uh, that William um, beat me back uh, about halfway through the game. Uh, I was doing well up to a certain point, so I'm sure that had something to do with my uh, my enjoyment of it. Um, again, there's several other things that I could bring up, but it, just not enough time at, right now. We'll have another whole episode. We'll talk about some things about it, but. It it is definitely Sid Meier's civilization in a box, and I, I know they uh, <laughs> they would have run into lots of issues if they had printed that on it, but there are this is almost exactly Civilization 2. Uh, I know they're on Civilization 6 now. My son plays Civ 6, um, and he plays it often. Um, but uh, this is more like probably the Civilization Two. So this was back when I was in high school, maybe starting college, the, the, the comparison I would make. But it is almost step-for-step step civilization. There's a few small differences from Sid Meier's, but it is really uh, very close to the same game. And I love that game. I used to spend, actually, Jamie, my wife will tell you, uh, she used to fall asleep to me playing it, uh, sitting on the floor on a computer, uh, <laughs> a, a, a full desktop computer that took up a whole cube um, of, of our uh, entertainment center and she'd fall asleep night after night uh, and I'd be playing that till three four five in the morning and then uh, she'd get up the next morning and I was just going to bed so uh, I love Sid Meier's Civilization this game again it, it's tough I, I think in more plays it, it, it'll go up but right now I would put it at probably a six it's a game I'd have to be in the mood to play. I would need to understand what I'm getting into, which, again, I, I just didn't. At two-player, playing the short version and doing it in three hours, I think I would I'd really enjoy that. But uh, once it got much beyond three hours, it, it uh, felt a little long to me. So, But uh, what do you think, Mitchell? Uh, so I guess let me paint the picture a little bit. Carlos kind of took this out of the box, and me, him, and Will learned it kind of together. He already knew the basic rules. I enjoyed it. Um, there were some things I think that we didn't even. I feel like it's supposed to be a combat game. We never fought each other, and that has something to do with, well, like we said, with the ocean. Um, I like games. I, I understand games have to have rules, but I like games where I don't feel confined. This is a game where you have to do a te have to have a tech to do almost anything. And like I, I made some troops, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna move these troops over here, and was like, you don't have the tech for that. 
Like what? Yeah. They don't know how to walk. Okay. <laughs> but at the, the converse of that is that you, um, at the end of every round, you get a tech for free, which that does feel good. Our game maybe took maybe three hours, something like that. And so it wasn't horrible. Um, and then the next day, you guys were playing. Uh, Carlos was going to teach two games at the same time. And I was like, I think I would rather uh, go learn a new game. <laughs> yeah. So I, I sat out. And I actually ended up getting roped into another very heavy game, which I'll talk about later. I'm like, oh, man, I'm being this all day. And then I'm not going to miss out on the other games they play. And I started the learning that other game before Carlos. I, actually, you guys had already started playing. The teach was done. So I learned and played on Mars, which is a very mm, long game yeah, right. before you guys finished and y'all had already started. Yeah. So that had me a little wary to ever play again. <laughs> um, I enjoyed the game, but I feel like there are other games that I could play in less time and get multiple games in that I would enjoy more. So I know this is going to be blasphemy to Carlos, but I think I have to agree with Rob. No. Six got to be in the mood. <laughs> yeah. I, it was a good game. But but I, I think if I would have played the fast variant that you found out about like the next day, Carlos, I would be much more game. Agreed. Yeah, and this is one of those games that you have to be set in the mood for yeah. because it, in my plays of this, this is going to maybe top out my favorite game of TI4, which is also another one of those games, those event games that you have to set up ahead of time and expect yeah. to be there. Just not This one's just not as long as TI4. This was yeah. faster than TI4. Sure, for sure. Uh, but it definitely is one of those in the mood games. Uh, I don't think anybody will be surprised when I say because it's almost beaten out TF4. I, I give this thing, you know, a ten at the end of the day. <laughs> it's I will be willing to play this anytime someone's any. And I was like looking around for people oh, at were, the con. You were. Hey, you want to play uh, Clash of Cultures? <laughs> Carlos was like, you know, I think I'd be okay to just play this for the rest of the con. And this was like the second day of the con. He was like, yeah, I'll just play this for the rest of the con. And I played it at least once each day of the con. Yep, and I'm happy to have Hits done your it. Your 12 do games. it again. Yeah, <laughs> and, and when when we go in July yeah. to Dice Tower, I'm bringing it with me and doing it again. Okay, yeah. you closed out the con playing that game. The Dice Tower people had rolled out all the shelves yeah. of game. Yep. you were still sitting there one, playing Clash of Cultures. One of the last tables playing. Yep, for I was sure. teaching Clint how to play it. Yep, so that was uh, Clash of Cultures for me, uh, and which is again Wits Kids Games, Christian Markinson design. Man, that game needs to sponsor this show. The amount of time you've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Well, okay. Uh, for my next one, I think actually I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, I'm going to double up on this one. I'm going to do two games that we uh, combo. Yeah, we talk about and we compare a lot. And these are compared and talked about a lot. But I had a chance to play both of them at the con. And I don't believe Carlos played either one of them with me. Uh, I think Mitchell might have played one of them with me. But this is uh, one of Carlos's favorites, Lost Ruins of Arnak, and one of my all time favorites, Dune Imperium. So these games are compared constantly just because I think mostly because they came out close to each other. They have some similar mechanics, although I agree with uh, most of the uh, discussion recently that these are two very different games. They're definitely different weights, I would say. Uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a little more lighter family weight, a little more, and this is something we talked about pretty extensively at the con, especially with uh, Nick Oban, that Lost Ru Ruins of Arnak gives you a lot more options. There's a lot more freedom. You don't feel as restricted. It's a game that um, you can play cards and do things in a lot of different ways, and he enjoys it for that reason, that it gives him lots of different paths and lots of different things to do. Dune Imperium, to some extent, is the opposite. Dune Imperium, the reason I love Dune Imperium is because it is so tight. Resources are hard to get. Uh, there are a certain number of spaces on the board that you can go to. Usually everybody's trying to go to those same handful of spaces, and so a lot of times you're if you're first in the turn, order you're going to grab one of those good spots if not you got to try to figure out a way to make something work with what you've got and it's it's based on what's in your hand based on the spaces that are available on the board and dune is a little infuriating sometimes in dune you're going to have turns it's like i didn't do much with that turn I just had to maximize what I could get, but that's what I love about it. I can see the flip side of the coin. Again, I can see the the people who love Lost Ruins, that it is more fun, more light, more, um, uh, I don't know the term. Friendly to player experiences. Friendly player experience. There you go. Dune is a little more thinky. It's a little more, uh, I'm in my game. I'm sitting here hoping, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. I need to go there. And you went there. Oh, now what am I going to do? I'm going to start How over. am I going to get my troops to the combat now? Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. So, and I love that that end of round combat at the end of every round in Dune. You don't have to be in the combat, but there's going to be a combat, and there's going to be some benefits and some rewards for it. And that's like another whole part of the game. You don't have that in Lost Ruins. In Lost Ruins, you're you're uh, you know you're trying to figure out how to move up those tracks. Which thing do I want to optimize this turn to get as many points to push along whichever track? You know, which cards am I going to pick up to help build this engine to do that thing? Dune. A lot of it is about that end of round combat. There's a bonus victory point out there and victory points are so tough to come by in Dune. You've got a 10 point scale so as somebody goes above 10 the game ends and so I love that part about Dune. I, I can see the appeal in both games. I got a chance to play uh, both of them. I played Dune at four player. Uh, we played that. It was me and uh, Nick and uh, we played with the newest uh, member of the Dice Tower group um, uh, Cleghorn um, I forget. Camilla. Camilla. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I was forgetting her first She's name. She's super nice. She's yeah. very affable. She's very nice. Hero. Yeah, very friendly. Very friendly. I, I, uh, I got a chance to talk to her several times during the con, and she's really friendly, really, uh, really fun to play a game with, and she'll she'll jump into any game of anything pretty much any time. So a lot of fun. Uh, and then we, uh, a group of us from our our group from Tampa, played uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak. Did you get in on that? Uh, Mitchell, I can't remember if you played no, that. I, us, no? I mean, I've, I've played Arnak okay. before, but I didn't get to play Arnak at the con. Yeah, but uh, two good games. I, I'm going to rate them very similar here. I, I'm going to give Dune a nine. Uh, that that again, it, I think Dune is in my top ten games of all time now. Dune Imperium, and I can't wait for the expansion to come out. Uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak is is right behind it. I'm going to give it an eight. Uh, I, we we kind of play up sometimes that, especially between me and Carlos, because we are on both sides of that coin. That I love one and hate the other, and he loves one and hates the other. I think we both enjoy both of them, and and we'll get his opinions on that in a minute, but uh, uh, I, I do enjoy both. They are different experiences, and I, I enjoy them in different crowds, but Dune, I feel, is more the gamer's game, the more gritty game. Uh, Lost Ruins is going to be more I'd love to play with the kids. I'd love to play, you know, uh, I don't have to think as much. It's just a quick game I want to get in. Uh, well, I wouldn't say quick, but they're about, they're fairly fairly uh, similar in length, but anyway, what are your opinions? Uh, I believe you played both, haven't you, Mitchell? Yeah, I played both. Actually, yep. you guys taught me Lost Ruins of Arnak last time I was That's in right. town. Yep. Um, I like I like both games a lot. I think they're very similar, where you either play a card for its suit to place a worker somewhere, or you play a card for its ability, which is weird that they both came out at the same time with that kind of unique combo mechanic. Um, like I said, I didn't get to play Arnak at, at, at the con. I did get to play Dune Imperium. Uh, they were really beefed up. They had like little um, bottles of, of spice. It was really, oh, really cool. Yeah. Um, you, you guys' this game of Dune was very, very long, though. Uh, I don't know that was the longest game I it tends to run long do. yeah um i actually got to play um the expansion unreleased it was actually the day that the embargo ended that's right uh, at that's first right. they were telling us we couldn't take pictures of it they're like oh no the embargo ended today the rise of x expansion actually taught by mr tom bassel himself and i got to play with him it was fun so if you know uh dune it doesn't change things in a huge way um one of the, the major changes is that you have Dreadnoughts, which is a, a, another type of unit, which is worth three in a combat. And what's interesting is they never die. So if you win a combat, you go and you you place – Carlos's face. You go and you place them on one of those little uh, like banner locations where you get the, the, the bonus that you could win, and you could cover up people's banners. And after that next round, it goes back into your camp for future combat. There were also technology tiles that could be passive or one-time – um, and then the, the thing that I like the most, there was a new track called the shipping track, where whenever you get the, this, the action to, to move on the shipping track, you can either move up one space or down all the way. So if you go all the way to the top before you move down, you get all the benefits on the track. But if you need something more immediate, you can go up like at one or two spaces on the track and then go down and just get those benefits. That was kind of cool. Um, this new shipping track covered up some spaces on the board that, in my opinion, you very rarely see. Um it's some of the green. It was the, the green, the, the council part, right? The the political portion. There was still, there was still the high council, but it was uh, it was come, some ones on the right, and it also covered up um, the ability to trade spice, which one of the guys I was playing with, he said he works for Simon and Dune is one of his like favorite games ever. He was like, how the heck are we supposed to, is it buying or selling spice up at the top right? Top right, so, usually. Yeah. Yeah, he, I don't think he was too hot on that getting covered up. But Tom Vassell said, I don't think he was serious, but he was going to glue this new overlay <laughs> onto the board to always play with it. I heard him say um, that, yeah. The, the technologies I could do with or without, but the shipping track and the dreadnoughts were cool. On both of these games, it's going to seem a little crazy, but I am always willing to play either of these games. I think they're both 10s for me, both wow. Dune and Arnak. I gotta say, Mitch is more on the extremes with his rating. I guess I'm very much more conservative. <laughs> Twos and tens. No, he either loves it or seven. hates it. That is true, though. Yes, I do love it or hate it. Uh, for me, uh, uh, Rob shared a lot of my thoughts already in the game. 
Uh, I did write down my numbers before Rob spoke about his, so we can see kind of where we okay, align. Yeah. Uh, I gave both games eights. Oh, okay. As much as I like to give gruff on <laughs> on the differences of the two, and um, I think part of it is because Rob picked up Dune and I picked up Arnax. Yeah. You got to kind of root for it your home team. Our side, yeah. At the end of the day, when I rate both games, they're equal. Okay, they're they're equal to me. It's all about steam versus mechanics. I think. I think we had talked about that before. Arnak definitely has better aesthetics, but I think Dune is more mechanics based. Yeah, but Dune has that that flow that I really like. That build up to the conflict, whether you're in it or not. You know, watching that conflict happen each round is fun. Um, Arnak doesn't have that tension that builds up towards the end. When yeah. you talked about the expansion. I get stressed in Dune, not in Arnak. Yes, that's the thing. I, I get stressed in Dune, not so much in yeah, Arnak, because the monsters really don't scare me. Agreed. I'll take my fear card. Let's move on. Yep. But when you talked about the the mechs, what'd you call them? Uh, dreadnoughts? Dreadnoughts. Or ships. Yeah, my eyes lit up, because that's part of the, the negative play experience of Dune is you use it, you lose it. Right. Anything you send to the conflict is gone. And so it's it's why also why I don't like bidding games where you bid something and you lose the bid, right? Yeah. It's just it's a negative play experience. Now, if there's an option to spend more resources to get something that is more permanent, like a dreadnought, I think I'm gonna enjoy that too, because I, I would be the one that does spend all of the resources instead of buying regular troops. I want them to all be dreadnought so I can always use them. But that may not you end up. You can only winning. get two, but yeah, yes, you're limited. They're, they're yeah. Because it kind of it kind of sucks when you put everything into the conflict and then yeah you know you end up maybe getting second place in the conflict and now you're out you're not in any conflict for the next two rounds until you well, build up the thing that was nice and I didn't plan to do this it kind of just happened I ended up getting both of my dreadnoughts so the thing is if I use one at a time I can always have a dreadnought in because it's only the one in a conflict that goes out into the board and the other one you keep in reserve it was a nice kind of little combo that's a great decision point right having yeah. limiting you to one but always being able to use it. Uh, Dune, great game. Arnak, great game. Both of them, different feels, but I'll play either one anytime. Yeah, and just real quick, just uh, we've been trying to hit him up here. Publisher for Dune, Direwolf, uh, designer Paul Denham, and uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak. We've got uh, Czech Games Edition, CG, C's, uh, GE, and the designer uh, Min Elvin, Elwin, E-L-W-E-N. Um, and let me just uh, ratings uh, eight point one currently on Arnak and eight point three for Dune. So I mean they're almost identical in their ratings. I think if you average out our ratings, it's right about yeah, exactly right about that. that. Yep, right on. So I cheated there with two games, but uh, going to keep this list moving. Let's throw it back over to Mitch. Uh, yeah, the next game Nick pulled out that night. Uh, this is Thursday night. It was Mystic Veil. Vale. It's one I think all of us had played before, both Nick, Rob, and myself. Yep, it's a fun one. It's one of my favorite games. Uh, I like deck building, but this is deck building to the nth degree because you're not just building your deck but you're building the card you're sleeving in these um these advancements you can get up to three on each card um to make your cards better a lot of your cards start off blank and you have you have complete control over what they look like um and it, it's it's a push your luck mechanic you have these these red symbols you don't want to see more than uh three if you do you spoil and you lose your turn um but you can get these green symbols that uh counteract them so if you build your deck correctly by the end of the game you pretty much plan your whole deck all 20 cards and that's when it's really fun at the end of the game and you almost even have to get a piece of paper and write down okay i have this to spend like to, to yeah. keep track of how many of your symbols are, are are counteracting each other but i really really enjoy mystic veil vale. uh it's hard to rate this one i've, I've played it a lot um i think i'd have to give it give it about a nine it's, it's one of my top games yikes yeah, that's one of the few things I, I uh, wasn't crazy about the game. I, I really like the game. I've played it, I think, three times now. And actually, that all three of my plays have been within the last uh, four or five months. So this one's fairly new to me, even though it's not a newer game. Um, but this was, And this was one of the first, if not the first, that used this idea of using the sleeves to upgrade your cards where you... Hard crafting system, yeah. Okay, and they, there I you think go. they patented it. Other games are using it now. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they've done at least one or two more games with it now. Uh, when I say they, uh, let me just jump back here and check. It's AEG, and let me get the designer here. John uh, Declare. There you go, John Declare. Um, but yeah, there have been several other games, uh, and I, I know AEG has done at least one or two more games uh, where they're doing that card crafting system. Then that's like you say, taken off, and some other designers are now picking Canvas, up on it. Right. 
<clears throat> Canvas uses it. Oh, yeah, 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 Canvas uses it. So yeah, there, there's several examples of it. But yeah, really neat. Uh, I mean, that was really a, a, an innovative thing to do. And this game is fun. I I, I don't know if you've played it yet, Carlos. But, Negative. Uh, okay. I, I, another game I, I'm almost certain that you will enjoy. Um, I would say I'm going to put this at an eight. This is a game that I would play pretty much any time that it came out. I, I This isn't one that I necessarily have to be in the mood for. Um, it may not be the first game that pops to my uh, in my head when somebody talks about uh, playing a it says a 45 minute game, but uh, now that I've played it several times recently, uh, this one's this one's quickly moving up, and I, I want to get some more plays in. I played with the big box uh, once. Uh, Kenneth Fly uh, from our game group taught it to me over uh, at. Um, um, Armada Games uh, just about four or five months ago, and he had the big box. So I was going to say, the one thing I didn't like, though, is that that symbology. As you mentioned, at the end of the turn, you've got these little symbols that you can buy, these special cards that are off to the side, and sometimes they require multiples of those symbols, and you've got this whole splay out in front of you sometimes of seven, eight, nine, ten cards, and you're having to go back and count, okay, i got two bear claws, I've got one starburst, I've got this, that. In the big box edition, they came out with little um, counter things that uh, I don't know what to call them. They're little oh, tokens. They're yeah, tokens for each one, and then as you get them you have these tokens that you spin them in front of you to spin up all right i got two claws this that and they allow you a lot easier to count those up and and then to look at the the, the cards that you're trying to buy to purchase those and then you spin them down so that was a big help in that part of it but yeah the, the rest of the game i find real smooth and elegant and again another one carlos needs to play soon but yeah good game but back to you carlos what's up what to rob you give it an eight uh mitch yep. is at a nine on that one i'm 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 enticed to play it okay yeah but but do you think it's fiddly with the cards and the sleeving them together, did that take up too much time or did that keep no, it moving? I don't think so, yeah. It's quick. As you're doing that, the next person's taking their turn. So you're cleaning up and slotting your cards. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, you can really only quick. buy, I think, two around. So I mean, yep. that quick. Yep. It's quick. Uh, for me, uh, Camel Up Off Season is the next game I'm going to bring up. And I think uh, Mitchell did not play with us in that one. Nope. Um, that is correct. It, uh, Camel Up Off Season is a, is a spin off of the Camel Up game. It's what, happens in the off season and right? so each player is going to have a caravan of four camels uh this is published by pretzel games and designed by stefan club and anna oppulzer oppulzer yeah. oppulzer and it's a it's a new release 2021 title william really wanted to play it we you get four camels each camel can carry either three four five or six goods on it each round you're going to be drawing goods from these offerings on the table some of them face up some of them face down you're not quite sure what you're getting uh, but you're you're hoping to set up sets of goods for each camel because each camel is only going to carry that one set of goods so you're trying to load out each camel with your sets of goods on that camel in order to score that set each set scores differently so like vases they want to score for the matching type of vase the dates you want uh any number of dates on there are going to score that was kind of like the easy one the fruit you want certain types of fruit on your camel because you want the high scoring fruits only because the low scoring fruits have to be sold before you can sell off your high scoring right. fruits uh, and then your your carpets or your rugs you want them to be a variety of colors, like a rainbow of colors. So if you happen to have red already on that camel, you don't want to have to draw another red carpet because you got to put it on that camel, and now it's not going to help you towards your set. And each camel can only carry three, four, five, or six goods. And what's fun is the theme on it, right? The straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> if you ever exceed the number of cards on that camel that that camel can carry, all those goods are gone. Like that camel, it breaks, it's bust, it's done. So if you happen to draw face down cards and they all happen to be carpet and that exceeds your carpet limit on your three carpet camel you've busted so yep. it's kind of got this push your luck feeling to it yep. uh it's it was a late night game but it fit well because it wasn't too hard to play yeah uh, it had that push your luck fun to flip and and see it had actions that you can take based on the location you went to and it played fairly fast so it was pretty enjoyable Agreed. Um, i would say it was a quick fun game in if I had to give the BGG style rating, I would put it in the good, like seven. You know, I would say seven. It, it, nothing super exciting. Nothing that really made me say, "Oh wow, this is amazing." But it just, just good. 
That's Good. Ex- exactly where I'm at as, as a seven. That's I'll start with my rating on this one. Um, very important to note that this has nothing to do gameplay wise with the uh, original Camel Up. I mean, that's a big thing. A lot of people supposedly have been fooled by that. They thought this is some kind of upgrade to the Camel Up was a racing game. This is not a racing game. This has nothing to do with racing. This is set collection. This is uh, hand management. Uh, push your luck. Resource management. Yeah, push your luck. Uh, this is a, a completely different game. So it's just they're just using the the name and the camels and the 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 scene, the setting, is the only uh, similarities between the two. This one, again, a quick 45-minute game. It says three to five players. Uh, it says eight and up. I think I would agree with that. I mean, this is a very family weight game. It did have bidding in it, though. I, I, you know, that, uh, that, okay, a bidding bit. is never my favorite mechanism. What do you think yeah. of the bidding aspect? The bidding was a little weird, too, because when there was a tie, it would move to the next lowest bid. Uh, yes. So that was kind of weird. So if, if uh, two people bid to, to go first and they bid two and then uh, if two people were at two and then one person only bid one, the one would win. The two twos would cancel out. Or if there were three twos, the three twos would cancel out and the person who bid one. So that was a little bit of an interesting twist. I don't know that I've played many other games that have done it that way. Uh, a lot of times there's a rebid between the, the people who bid the most or something like that. But uh, in this one, yeah, I did kind of... Uh, it. it benefits you to be try to be unique if you really want to go go you know go three or go four go like mitch yeah because you don't want to all in or just a little bit yeah there you go so yeah you don't want to tie because then you <laughs> give it give it to someone who really maybe didn't want it as much so um but yeah i think i would agree with that rating um it's a game that i would play again again to me it would be kind of a filler game it says 45 minutes i think say even with uh, with four or five players if again if everybody knows how to play it i could see you knocking this one out in 30 minutes i mean this is a pretty quick game so but yeah, it was it was fun. It's uh, not one that I'd run back to, but it was fun. Have you seen this one, Mitch, on the table? Yeah, uh, I, I haven't played it, but I remember hearing about it at Gen Con. We were in the, uh, in the elevator. I think Will had played Camel Up, and he saw someone holding the box. He's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's when the camels aren't racing what they're doing. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> intriguing, yeah. but I haven't played it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a good game. All right, we're on to you, Rob. Let's keep these games going. This oh, is a super okay. marathon. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to jump to a game that I, uh, I'm going to pull it up here, um, is, uh, it's, it's an older game. I'm going to find out here in a minute exactly how 2018 release. Uh, this is from uh, Stoneblade Entertainment, um, designer Gary Arant and Justin Gary. Um, this is Shards of Infinity. Um, this is a game I had never played. Uh, Nick had played it uh, recently, and I know that guys in our game group um, uh, have played this. I've seen this at almost every game day. It seems like this is a filler game that people like to pull out and uh, and play in between games while they're waiting for players to finish up another game so they can get in a, a bigger, heavier game. Um, it was explained to me that it was real similar to... Uh, What's it? Hero Quest. What's the space based one? We used to play all the time uh, when we worked together. Um, the cards. Uh, I know. I'm, it's in my mind now because uh, you yeah. had the Federation <laughs> ships. You got the blobs. You got yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that one. Yeah, that's that's the one. I forget the name of it. But this is uh, this is a deck builder, a uh, hand builder. Um, you you are playing cards. Uh, to uh, you're, you're trying to take out your opponent. It really is. You're trying to. Uh, each person has a health limit, and you're trying to play cards to attack your opponent. Um, you've got. Uh, I think it's four different factions in this game. Uh, one of the kind of unique things, though, is that you start out with a leader. Uh, the, you you choose one of the four different colors as your player board, uh, which also counts your points and things like that. But you uh, uh, at the beginning of the game, you choose one of those, and then you can combo up as as you draft cards out of a market. If you go with that same color. In a turn, as you're playing cards down, if you play multiples from the same color, and especially if you play them from whatever faction your leader is from, it's going to give you uh, comboing abilities. It's going to allow you to do the the main action that's on the card, but then there'll be a secondary action that if you've played another yellow card or a green card or a blue card, that it might give you plus two on that attack, or it might give you plus two on the buy or something like that. So it's it's your standard uh, deck builder. Your uh, uh, I'm going to pull that up. It's uh, the uh, uh, you're, you're buying cards out of a market to make your hand stronger, to do bigger and bigger attacks, to knock your opponent down. Um, there's a, a unique ability in this that, uh, uh, I guess, part of the infinity that comes in is that you, as you hit certain thresholds, uh, in there's a power meter you can choose to attack or you can just uh, you can buy stuff or sometimes you can just take power. And so you have a little power meter that goes up. And as you get more and more power, um, you hit thresholds. And there's certain cards that you'll play that if you're at a 10 power, instead of doing two damage, you do five damage. Or 
or instead of having two buy, you get four buy or something. Uh, there's also that the one that multiplies your damage. If you ever get up to 30 power, which is where your power maxes out, and then you can mill through your deck to get that uh, attack card. I'm going to see if I pull it up here on the BGG somewhere. Um, then it'll allow... the Infinity Shard. There you go, the Infinity Shard. That's uh, for the name of the game. So Mitchell knows uh, knows it better than I do. <laughs> but when you play that, it allows you to do kind of an infinite attack. And basically, no matter what... Insta-win? You... Yeah, insta-win. No matter what your opponent's life is, you knock it all down and you win all in one shot. So... But you still have to draw the card. Just because you get right. to 30 mana doesn't mean you win. So right. it's like, well, am I going to draw this card? Exactly. So there it is there on the on this picture on the all far right there, the Infinity Shard. So if you're at 10 power, you get a certain amount of attack. If you're at 20, you get a certain amount of attack. But if you get 30, it's just an infinite attack. And so you'll knock your opponent uh, automatically out of the game. One of the other cool little things here is uh, this example here. There's a mercenary card. When these mercenary cards come up, or there's a set of them, uh, different ones for the different factions. But you can either pay the cost and then draft it into your hand and have a, an ability that happens every time it comes up or you can spend it right now and you can just do it as a one-time bonus on this turn that you bought it and so you can activate it immediately and use it immediately multi-use decisions right. i like it right so there's that decision on these mercenaries do i do i uh, draft them into my hand keep them and do probably you know do that same thing over and over every time it comes up but in the late game you probably want to use those to do it now because you know you know you're coming up and you're probably not going to see that card very many times if you put it in your hand so kind of a unique spin uh, i'll say that i was really excited to play this again because I know it's it's well played in our group and I've been hearing about this another one that's you know kind of coming becoming a classic I've heard about it so much when I actually played it though it didn't do as much different from all the other games like this that I played that I, I, I felt a little let down by it. I was really expecting something really unique and something really special and cool about it. And I, um, I, I didn't feel that it really had something that it did that was way different than a lot of these other games. And so I would probably give this a seven. It's still a solid game. It's, it's probably one of the better ones that does what it does. But uh, I guess it might be just my expectations were a little, little higher coming into it. But solid game. I'd, I'd play it pretty much any time it came out. So, uh, so it sounds like you know quite a bit about it, Mitchell. What's your experience with it? Yeah, so I haven't played it at the con, but I own it, and I played a good bit. I, I like it. I think it's got some unique mechanics, like those mercenaries. If you're in a pinch, like you're about to die, and there's a mercenary that heals you, yeah, grab it. Sure. There are a couple other unique things, like there are the champions. Um, there, there are champions that are persistent cards that they stay out, and you can do their ability every time unless somebody spends an attack to attack them instead of you. There's also shields on some cards that if you have them in your hand, you can reveal them. You don't have to discard them, but you reveal them to block damage. Right. And especially in a multiplayer game, that's pretty unique because, like, let's say I want to do – I have 10 damage to deal, um, and I'm deciding if I want to give it to you or you. And I say, okay, I'll give you five damage, and now I reveal to five shield. Yep. It's like, oh, well, if I want to actually do damage to you, I only have five damage left, and it's in two different attacks now. And now you can use that shield again because you don't discard the shield. Yeah. So it's like you have to decide, do I pile damage on this one person hoping they have a shield or do I try to split it up amongst everybody? I will say that in odd number player games, like in a three player game, what happens is one person starts to – is like a clear leader and then everybody beats up on them. And so it, I, it's better at even numbers in my opinion. This is a good game. Okay. I think you'll probably be a little bit surprised with my rating, but again, I maybe this is the wrong way to look at rating games, but it's how I do it. It's how much bang can I get for my buck? This is a very quick game, yeah. So I, and I like it. So there's almost no time when I'm going to say no, I'm not going to play this because I know I can bang this out, even with a teach, probably in less than 30 minutes, um, especially at a two-player play count. And so I could play this and then go on and play another good game. I'm going to give it a nine. I enjoy uh -huh. playing it. I'll almost okay. always say yes because I can get a lot out in just a small time commitment. Sure, People play? always ask how I play so many games at a time. That's how. Like, it makes sense. Out one and yeah. then play something else long after that. You're focused on the efficiency. Yeah. I played it with right. three. I don't know if that affects that. I did play it with three, and uh, we Dan was in the middle of doing a, a game trade, so he was back and forth a little bit, so it slowed us down a little bit. I was going to say it took us probably 45 minutes to an hour, but that was largely because of the teach and because of that. Um, Dan had played before. It was me, Dan, and, and William that played it. But, uh, okay, yeah, I could see that. It's uh, Star Realms also. I wanted to give credit for Star Realms. That was the other one I was That's uh, the one. Star Realms. game I was trying to think of. But what do you think, Carlos? I've not played it. Uh, I've heard Jamie Stegmaier, when he called into our show, he talked about it. Yep. Um, so it, it's something that's inspired him as well. Sure. Uh, it, Michael Lorenzo can't stop talking great things about it. Raph can't stop talking. It seems like everybody loves it. Yeah. Uh, but, Rob, my concern is, is like what Rob said, is it something that's more different than any of the other deck builders that I already enjoy? 
Yeah, it felt very Star Realmsy to me. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. There were definitely uh, one thing I forgot that Mitchell mentioned was the the shielding. That's kind of cool that you you don't have to discard the card if you have a shield. You don't you can sit on it and then when somebody attacks you, then you flip it around and just show them. Hey, I got a shield of five. I blocked five of that, and so that's fun. It makes for some interesting uh, decisions. Yeah, shards of infinity. And theme wise, uniquely, this game was pitched to me initially as an off brand Marvel, and so. Um, the the infinity shard is like the infinity gold. It can sure. do infinite damage, oh. right? So I, I kind of think of it in that light too. Okay. It, I think that helps a little bit. Sure. And snap. Done. Done. That's it. Yeah. All right, Carlos. Yeah. Up to you. No, it's back to Mitch. Oh, hey, it, man, I'm sorry. I'm skipping, me I'm skipping Mitch. All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. The, the next game we played. This we're on Friday now. Um, was Meadow. Will pulled it out. He owned it. It's a new game. Uh, released in 2021 from Rebel Studio, designed by Clemens Kalicki. Whenever he first pulled this out, I, I'm an Omni gamer. I will play any game one time. He pulled it out, and I was like, okay, sure, yeah. Everybody else, uh, Dan and, and Rob, seemed down for it. But it did not seem like it was going to be my jam. It's, it's like too a pretty. nature walk. <laughs> yeah. And then he started explaining it, and it's like a tableau builder, and it seemed very simple at first. But I was pleasantly surprised with this game. Um, so you have an array of 16 cards that you're drafting for your tableau. You have these little wooden planks with arrows on them, and – it's one, two, three, or four. So on three of the four sides of the array, you can put your arrow, and if it's a number three, then you count. One, two, three, over, and that's the card you get. And so, but that same card, if I were on the other side, it needed two because we're counting across four. So with four players, it was very tight. If you wanted, uh, um, not just if you want a certain card, but if you want a certain space. If I want the space that's all the way to the right and somebody's already used all the slots to put their arrows in, then I cannot get that card. So that was pretty cool. And then the way your tableau worked, it's like animals and biomes and things. So like you need to have a, a tree biome to get a bird. But then the bird will go and he'll eat like the requirement, like a bug on the top of the tree and you cover the bug. So then you can't use that bug anymore, but now you have a bird. Um, in addition to that, there was a separate board. I think it was called a campsite board that if you didn't want to use your little arrows to get one of the cards, you could flip them around and they each had an action, like draw multiple cards and, and thing, or draw any card. Um, whenever you would go on the campsite board, you wouldn't be drawing a, um, yeah, you wouldn't be picking a card. Um, but there, there was, it, it looked like a rondelle, wasn't really a rondelle, but there were different symbols around the campfire randomly placed. And if you had both of those symbols on your card, you could claim the spot between the two of them, um, to get victory points. And, and so once somebody claimed that specific pairing, nobody else could do it. You have these three tokens that you can use that increase in value. You have to start with the smallest one. So it was a very tight game at four. I actually really, really enjoyed it. You have these different columns and rows. It's like you're starting off with something basic, and it's like you're building an engine, but then it's almost like you have to consume that engine because the animal is going to come and eat that that insect or berry or whatever. I thought it was really cool, really unique. Um, big surprise for me. I would probably give it uh, an eight. Well, Okay. And from what you've said about some of these puzzly games, an eight uh, is pretty high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, so the thing is, I, I didn't view it as a I guess it is puzzly. But I, I, it didn't come across that way. Maybe it was because of the theme. Uh, maybe it fooled me. What did you think of it, Rob? I liked it. I, actually, I liked it better than I thought I was going to as well. It was another one of those games that, uh, uh, you know, kind of a puzzly, I'd call it a puzzly game, like a uh, kind of like a calico or something. Uh, you're not quite slotting things into into spaces. Um, you know, you're building that tableau, and it is a little more open. Uh, it's a little more like Cascadia, I think, because you can build several paths. You can, uh, they've got those, those roads you can go down and start multiple different roads. Uh, you don't have to necessarily finish anything that you're doing. You're going to get points for every car that you're able to put down, um, so you can kind of go halfway on a, on a certain column or a certain road that you're venturing down. I really like, like you mentioned, this main board here where you're, where you're uh, I guess, called drafting these cards, but you're having to place the one, the two, the three, and the four, and you can get blocked out if uh, there's a card that uh, you got to make some decisions on which card do I want more, because when it comes back around to me, if everybody keeps taking the actions on that main board, there's a good chance that I'm not going to be able to get that second card that I need up there. So this is a game that you've got to have a bunch of secondary options in the back of your mind you've always got the one thing that you want to do but you've got to have that next thing ready to go because uh, there's a pretty good chance by the time it gets back around to you you may not get what you want and so you need to be able to react quickly you need to be able to have a secondary thing that you can do that's not going to mess up what you're trying to do but yeah the, the art uh, is is awesome you know the uh, the style of art on these cards the almost like a watercolor look of them is really really cool um i'll have to look in a moment here and see actually just take a quick look and see who the artist is we don't give credit to the artist a whole lot here, but... Uh, Carolina Kidjack? Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce that. 
Yeah, but uh, very cool art, and I, I liked it more than I thought. I was going to say I probably would give it an 8. And again, I'm not big on the puzzly games, um, but this is a game that pretty much any time it came out, I'd recommend it to people who enjoy puzzle games for sure, and I, I think everybody should give it a, a shot. So, uh, this is one of those games that, again, doesn't take a whole lot of time. It says 60 to 90 minutes is what it's advertised here, one to four players. I'd say we knocked it out probably 90 minutes with the teach, I would think, and then once everybody knows how to play the game, I, I think 60 minutes is, is plenty of time to get this in. I about an hour i feel like it might have been 90 minutes after the teach because i don't you know think? if you recall but you didn't eat breakfast you're waiting on nick to wake up remember you <laughs> oh you went okay. <laughs> maybe um okay. yeah i will say this is at least in, earlier on in the round you have a lot of options I, I i pride myself i try not to do to be too ap this game got some analysis paralysis for me because yeah. i had to look at all my options every turn yeah um because you know the, those planes clear at the end of each round and i was like oh i can go anywhere now yeah, stuff so just filling I in. I feel like with more playing, more plays, it would get faster. We were all new except for Will. So. Yeah, for sure. And you've played this, Carlos? I've yeah. not had an opportunity oh, to play it, but I am intrigued by the preferencing system that it uses with that center board. You mm -hmm. know, where you got to you pick a side of the board and an account in, right, to decide to determine how you're preferencing what card you want. Um, it. It's very interesting. Like, how would we apply that in the rest of life? Like, you know, <laughs> preferencing for maybe players and a draft or, you know, schedules at work. Like, how could we apply this preferencing system to life yeah. is why I'm really intrigued in it is. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Fun game. All right. It's Carlos. Oh, I'm going to jump in and talk about uh, Bad Company. I don't think it's released yet. I don't believe so. so yeah, somebody mentioned that they were trying to find it and they couldn't find it anywhere yet. Yeah, build your own gang, complete heist, and escape the police. That's Bad Company. It's published by Aporta Games and designed by Kenneth uh, Mind, uh, Elif Svensson, Christian Amundsen. Amundsen. Os Amundsen. Osby. Osby. Uh, <laughs> sure. Good Good with that. But the, the way I describe this game and the way I've heard it described, it, it's, it's almost like... Space Space, the game with a different theme, yeah, uh, is how I went into the game. It's one of these games where one player is going to roll paradise, and every player is going to have a tableau with uh, a, the spread of available numbers from those die rolls that they can activate. So one player rolls a dice, and each player is going to be able to activate whatever they've applied to that number. Right. So if I roll 2d6 and I get, uh, let's say, a 5 and a 4, I can apply the four on its own, or I can do the five on its own. Uh, I guess Machikoro started this. Yeah. Or I can do the nine, the com combination of the five and the four together. Right. right. But everybody gets a trigger if you have something in that slot when everybody's rolling. I enjoy those type of games because it keeps things moving. Every, no, low downtime because we're all watching right. Mitch roll his dice in hopes that he gives me my seven. Yep. Like, Poppy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Has that Vegas craps kind of feel to it. Yep. Uh, why... What's different about this one than Space Base? It's going to be the theme. The theme in this one is you're collecting uh, groups of like thugs, thugs yeah. <laughs> that you're bringing to your gang. And so you're going to place them, and they're going to give you different symbols when they activate. You're going to then use those symbols as tokens to cover up goals on different cards. These are the heist, right? So one person might bring you hands, right? Another person might bring you uh, driving. Another person can give you flashlights. So you're going to use these icons to place on your goals in order to complete those goals, and that's how you're going to score your points in the game. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Rob's got a cool picture of it. As you begin replacing these folks or adding more folks to that one column, you see their bodies start to stretch, stretch real out. tall. <laughs> so it gets really weird. <laughs> right. So I focus mostly on on building just my center of my board, you know, because I know that for the most part, six, seven, eight, and nine are going to be the numbers that hit the most. There's high probabilities. Right? There's yeah. high probabilities of hitting those. William played a whole different version where he went with the spread across. He wanted to fill each slot. So no matter what die was rolled, he had something he can trigger. William did end up winning the game. I thought I was run I thought I was going to be the runaway leader on this one. Oh yeah, because like I, I felt like up. I was doing great. <laughs> but William's just consistent ability to play let him win the game. One of the cool pieces of this game. Why is it interesting? Is a sideboard that kind of reminds me of Grand Theft Auto, and you got your car and the cops chasing it, and you're moving it up, and you're trying to stay ahead of the cops. If your cops catch up to you at the end of the game, you lose some points. You can't do some things. So it just keeps the game is just it's fast, and I think it's faster than Space Base. And it has a fun theme. Uh, so I just don't know if I'd pick it up. So there's a good amount of humor in this one. That was one thing that I found even from the beginning of the game when you uh, when you get two starting boards. There's a left half uh, from, what's it, numbers one through seven, and then a right half or one through six, and the other half seven through, or no, it's eight through 12 in any case. Um, they 
they title each one of them. So you see that like on this picture here. So one of the, the gang's names ends up being Lucky Angels, and the yes. other one is the Lazy Ninjas. And so they give you two keywords on each one, so it kind of gives you a little funny name for your gang that you're building as very you Very themey. But yeah, yeah, very, very themey. So. And you can see a lot of the inspiration for the thugs from movies. Yeah. Right? So you can see like a Fight Club thug. and a, Yeah. It's... And some some of the pictures of the thugs as they uh, as you grow them they change their their style body styles they change their clothes they change their faces or their heads and so there's there's just some funny little winks and nods in there to different movies and different uh, uh, Ocean's Eleven that kind of stuff and then what was really unique again I, I like Space Space a lot I, I think I might like this one more a lot of people have said that they play in this they like this one more but it's these extra boards that you have you got this one where you're trying to outrun the cop car and as you're as you're moving ahead on that one you're picking up bonuses you can take little shortcuts that get you ahead faster um, and get you to the finish line at the end of the game if you're in the finish area you can get some bonus points but then you miss some of the bonuses that you pick by driving through the main road and getting those bonuses there's another sideboard that you upgrade your you know where you upgrade your thugs um, you're having to spend money so you're collecting money various ways and then you're spending it to move to these different locations on this other sideboard and then there's just a, a stack of uh, face down thug cards and you draw three off the top you select one you discard the other two and then you slot it in wherever the number matches and uh, it can make those uh, as you slot them in you'll see here at the bottom you can get more and more of each of the symbols so now on this one here when a six is rolled you're going to get two flashlights a hand and a gold so you're going to multiply what you get by rolling certain numbers so uh, very comparable to space space did you uh, give this one a rating you, uh... i did and i'm at a seven on it seven okay uh, mitch yeah. you didn't get to play this one right nope okay so um the reason I enjoy. I think I enjoy Space Space more, even though I think Space Space is going to be a longer play. Yeah, for sure. Than Bad Company, if Space Space has uh, more of a, a feel that you're building something, right? Because you get this economy thing going, right? You can get your little money engines going in Space Space. Yeah. Right. You're not playing towards a certain objective cards. Sure. Where in in Bad Company, the goal is to complete objectives. Mm -hmm. So you're really never building. Um, an engine. Sure. You're just acquiring symbols. So I felt like I didn't have as I didn't have an, as much investment in that crew, okay. right? Yeah. Like, you know, whereas Space Base, I feel like I built my own space station. Sure. I think I might like this one slightly better. I'm going to say they are very similar games. They give me a very similar feel. The thing I like about this one is I think this one plays a little faster than Space Base. And for this type of game, I'm not normally looking to want to play for an hour-ish, which is, I think, a lot of the, the games that I've played of Space Base have been pushing that hour. Uh, this one's advertised here as 30 to 45 minutes. And again, I think it's one, uh, it's one to six players. We played with, what was it, three? And I think with three players who know what's going on, you could knock it out in 30 minutes pretty easily. So um, it was six. You may you may get up to forty five minutes ish. So uh, for what it is, for for a, a quick little dice rolling, um, activating some stuff, moving some stuff around. I like the humor in this one, and I like how quick it is that you could play it and then move on to something else. So uh, I'm gonna say a seven. I'd, I'd probably give them both around a seven. I think, but yeah, seven seven for bad company. And it's uh, like you say, it's not out yet. I know we actually had somebody ask about it. They went online looking for it. And they couldn't find it anywhere yet. So, uh, but it, it should be out any day. It's it's right on the cusp of coming out. So. All right, that there is Bad Company. Looking forward to it coming out and maybe somebody get it, not us. I don't think we we're going to get it. Yeah, probably not. But Okay, uh, my next game was uh, a game that I played quite a bit before. It's uh, one of my all-time favorites. It's right up there, probably close to my top ten all-time. And I always uh, talk about this as being one of the most underrated games. I know uh, several outlets that we watch, Dice Tower and things, have mentioned that as well. Tom says one of his most underrated games uh, in the general market. But this one's Tyrants of the Underdark. Uh, great deck building game, area control. The first game, I'm sure there were probably others that did it before, but this was the first big game that I remember that came out that did the two. It uh, says a 2016 release, so not that old, just about five years ago. This one combines those two major mechanics of, uh, of deck building. You're uh, drafting, or not drafting, you're buying cards out of a market um, a, a deck. It, one of the two in-game triggers is that market deck running out. The other two, the other one is somebody placing their last figure on the board. But you're also doing area control. Uh, you're fighting back and forth. This is in a D and D setting uh, with the drow. And you're, uh, I'm not a huge D and D fan, but in spite of that, uh, this game is is a really good game. Um, and just that those putting those two mechanics together is so unique. Um, a few games have done it since then. I still think Tyrants is probably one of the better games that I've ever played that's done it. But um, you're you're attacking each other. Um, you've got uh, 
the, the base game comes with four different decks. And so before you start, you choose. You can either randomly or uh, choose on your own two of the four decks. You shuffle them together. Uh, the expansion came out with two more decks. So that if I've got the expansion, uh, you could have up to six. But in any, any case, no matter how many people are playing, you always choose two of the decks. You shuffle them together. The game um, is very uh, modular, or it's not modular, but it uh, it uh, scales well for the number of players. It plays two to four. Uh, if you play with two players, uh, I'm going to get to a picture here in a moment, hopefully. Uh, two players, you use just the center section of the board. If you add a third player, you add one of the two outside regions. And if you play with all four players, you use the whole board. Um, but it's, it's really simple mechanics. You're, you're just buying these cards out of the market, getting them into your hand. You're shuffling through your deck over and over as you cycle through your deck. You're playing these cards that allow you to attack your opponents uh, along places where you have what they call presence. So you have to build out from one starting area of the game, but you're attacking people in adjacent areas, knocking them off the board, uh, taking their areas. At the end of the game, they're scoring for each of the cards you have in your hand. There's also a, what they call a promote ability. Uh, later in the game, you're going to want to promote cards out of your hand because you see here on the bottom of the card there's a score there's a, a victory point amount if it's in your hand or there's a circle down there if you uh, use the promote ability sometime during the game it takes it out of your hand and puts it into what's called your inner circle so it takes it out so you can't use that card anymore but at the end of the game you score the uh, amount of points victory points for it of uh, the inner circle value which is tends to be about twice of what it is when it's just in your hand and so interesting decisions there about when to promote these cards out of your hand into your inner circle and then at the end of the game there's a lot of scoring you're scoring for all the different areas you're in you score points for just having control of an area you score bonus points for having what they call total control meaning that you have every spot in that area filled in um, throughout the game, also these major cities that are on the exterior of the board and a couple up the middle, you're going to get victory points uh, during the game, uh, victory point tokens for having total control of those from just one round to the next. Um, but just, uh, I'd say it's a fairly easy game to learn. There's only a handful of keywords on all of these cards that you have to learn. The decks are very different uh, between those four or six with the expansion different decks you mix together. Some of them add in some special some cards to the market that are going to be specific just to a certain race. Um, but uh, the they just did a reprint of this. Um, I have the original, which I think I'm happy. You'll see here these plastic bits do not come in the reprint. And the reprint, uh, to save some money, they made everything just cardboard chits. But you'll see there's quite a bit of plastic here in the original. Uh, I'm pretty happy with my original version of it. But this game, again, is one of my top, uh, right around my top 10 of all time. I'm going to give it a 9. Uh, it's, it's a borderline of a 10. I For me, it's really hard for me to give you any games a 10. There's only a couple of games, I think, uh, that have ever been 10s for me this one's pushing the 10 envelope but i'm gonna say if we if we don't go nine and a half i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a nine i'd, I'd play it pretty much any time it comes out and uh, i know i think it was dan who uh, mentioned playing it uh, at the uh, dice tower and uh, i think i might have given a little squeal when he mentioned it like, oh <laughs> yeah tyrants that's that's a game we can get out i know it's it's a big fan of his uh, he's a big fan of it as well so. hearing Rob squeal. <laughs> Ooh, squeal. Yeah. so uh, that, that's my my thoughts on tyrants uh, it, you guys have any opinions on tyrants i know you haven't ever played Mitchell, right? Nope. Okay, so probably not much of an opinion there. That we, was deep. We got to get you, we got to get you to play it sometime. It's it's a fun <laughs> game. But Carlos, what do you think about Tyrants? Uh, D and D. Yeah, D &D. all the way. D and D yeah, all the way. All D &D, uh, yeah. So I am someone who's played D and D. So the D and D artwork in here is just amazing. Right, the artwork is beautiful. The theme comes through with the different decks that you get. So if you have a corruption deck mixed in with a, a different other deck, you're yeah. really going to get the feel of that corruption because yeah. co it adds different mechanisms based on each half of the deck that you add before you shuffle in. Changes the game. Ch yeah. yeah, so you get to explore different mechanisms in the game. So replayability is high. I think uh, one of my favorite parts of the game has to do with that control and total control, two different indicators. Yep. If you have control of the board, you get buy power. You have total control of the board, you get buy power plus victory points. Hey. Right. The fun part is stopping people from having total, total control. control. Yeah. So, and that's the fun part about the game is the area influence piece. You know, I'm going to spend army power or, or military power to put units in places that you have. Maybe I'll add my spy over there so you can't have total control. Right. Just kind of denying you that. It's just fun. It's just fun. Uh, underrated. I think I said that before in in a review I did on Dice Tower or on the uh, the BGG, and someone's reply well, it's not underrated if it's got a seven point nine score. Yeah. And I said no, it's it's not the score. The score is high. Like people rate this thing high. It's just I really feel no one knows about it. Right. Nobody the people talks about that it. do love it are on here rating it, and yeah. they're rating it great. Agreed. It's that spread, right? There's not enough people knowing about it. That's why I call it underrated. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not because people think it's bad uh, score wise and it should be higher. No, I think more people need to know about this game. Yeah, it's just unknown. <laughs> Flat people, out. people don't talk about it for some reason. It might have to do with the theme. Again, it's a heavy D and D. Everything in this is D and D, and I I don't know the D and D world very well, but when I play with people who do. They're pointing out, oh, that's that, and that's that, and that artwork, and that, and that's you know that's right out of the book, the one of the D and D manuals, and so it, it's got that familiarization. And just real quick, publisher uh, here, Gail Force Nine, at least here in the states, and designers are Peter Lee, Rodney Thompson, and Andrew Veen. I can say those names. So hey. Yeah, um, so. I, I would say this game didn't get the big exposure it deserved because of its D and D marketing. Sure, right. Um, we've grown up. I've grown up buying any game that had D and D on it and finding just an IP cash grab. Sure. So I did not expect these games to have such quality. The 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 games that came from Gale Force Nines and Withers of Coast with the D and D marking on it recently have all been very solid solid good games not just cash grabs uh, yeah. i gave it a nine okay um it's really up there yeah i wrote that down before you said yours oh okay so it's yeah, it's a good one it's got to get played you should play this if you like uh if you like deck building if you like area control uh and especially if you like both of those things it's it's a must play. kind of a magic to gather and feel when you're playing cards and yeah. you know impacting each other playing yep. them for their abilities uh tyrants that's oh, tyrants of the, the underdark. underdark yep all right back to mitchell all right, this next one uh, I played, I think, while you guys are maybe finishing up your game of Clash of Cultures, your long one. Um, River Dragons, published by Matago, designed by Roberto Fraga. Um, I haven't played a whole lot of programming games before this one, and um, so whenever I, I saw this game, I thought it was going to be a lot different than it was, especially the artwork is kind of kitty. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised with it. Uh, it kind of drew my, drew my attention because they had a giant version they were setting up. And I was kind of just passing by looking for something to play while you guys were finishing up your game. And he said, hey, you want to play? I was like, heck yeah, sure, I'll play anything. Um, so it's a programming game. Uh, basically, you're you're this little boy and you're trying to hop from one side of like uh, the river to the other. And that's the goal. If you get to the direct opposite side, you win. It's a six-player game, so it's going to be best in multiples of two uh, so that you have the competition of the person directly across from you. Um, basically, um, in the first set of the round, you each program five cards. There aren't a ton of options. There's either place stones, which are uh, the bridges will go on, place bridges, move a different number of times, jump over somebody, remove a bridge, or make somebody else skip their turn. And so you, you all resolve the one in turn order, two, three, four, five. Um, if you can't resolve something uh, that has you moving, you have to go back to your, your starting like little dock. Um, each stone can only have a certain number of, of bridges on it. Whenever you pick up bridges, you can't have multiple of the same size. I think there's five or six bridges, and whenever you're going to place a bridge, you can't measure. You have to kind of – so if you try to save your six for something, so you want to use your five, but then you try to play your five and it doesn't reach, then you know you lose it. It's out of the game forever, I think it is. Um so it's not quite dexterity, but it's got a little bit of it. So, you know, like the stones that you're placing that the bridges go on, they have these little islands, but you can place them anywhere on the island you want. And even if you can barely just get your bridge to touch it, if it'll stay up, then you're good. Um, and you can use other people's bridges. This is one I picked up um, because I think it's one that uh, the kids could play. Sure. Um, play with me. Um, again, and it's a quick one. Uh, I, I the rating on BGG is only a 6.5. I think that's probably because it's a lighter game. But again, bang for buck, I would give this an 8. I thought it was fun, and it's it's something I can play with the family that's more than just, you know, the game of life. So I, I enjoyed this one. Have you all played this before? I've seen it played, have yeah. not played. Yeah, you played the gigantic version of it, right? The oversized version. Right. Yeah, and uh, I've seen it at, uh, at pretty much every Dice Tower. They, they've got that copy, the, the, the gigantic version. I've seen it out and on the table or on the floor um and, but i've never played it no i've always looked at it and kind of wondered about it uh it looks like fun i mean uh, that eyeballing and having to drop you mentioned programming i might have missed something there but how does the programming come into it so you choose what five cards you're going to do in order before anything happens and then uh, in turn order you all do your first card all do your second card uh, etc so you're trying to guess what other people are going to do so for example if you play the jump over somebody card and whenever that resolves there's nobody to jump over then your guy jumps into the water and swims back home <laughs> oh <laughs> okay all right fun i i think that could impact the score that you see on bgg because the the action queue or the programming games it i'm finding it takes a very specific person to really enjoy those because of that. those negative play experiences like oh i expected you to be there now you're not there anymore 
But the, the game is so quick and breezy that for us, anytime something like that would happen, we'd just be like, oh, you know, oh, it happened <laughs> to him again. And kind of thing. It kind of almost became a meme. It, it was all lighthearted. But I guess that's in a con situation where you don't know everybody playing. If it's your your core group and you keep doing that to that one guy, he might get salty. <laughs> a little bit. A little and bit. that's where I struggle playing with Rob because he can t- he, he knows my tales. Oh, he, yeah. he's like, I, I think like he, can, he knows what I want to do. Know what you're thinking. And he'll mess it up. Yeah. Uh, Cult Express. Uh, as a, uh, there you go. Yeah. What, so what, yeah, what rating would you give this one? Uh, I think an eight. Eight, okay. It's deceiving. It's de- It looks deceptively childlike, and I think that's just the theme. And I, I think a kid could easily uh, learn the mechanics, maybe not do great at it, but I'm looking forward to playing it with my kids when it comes in. All right. Cool. So River Dragons. Yeah, I didn't know anything about that one until uh, until you talked about it. So. I kind of like the idea of the of the gauging distance because it, it just brings me back to X-Wing. I'm trying to figure yeah. out what maneuver should I make with my ship? Will it fit? Right. Will I reach? Right. <laughs> sure. So it's that it's that gamble, and we play with our buddy. I imagine if our buddy Zeno played with us, we'd be in trouble. Zeno's <laughs> yeah. a mechanic. Yeah. And he can look at things and tell you exactly how big it is, and like what socket goes in there. Like that's an eight millimeter. That's just by eyeballing it. So yeah. some people just have that knack, that ability. Yeah. Uh, All right. What's up for you next, Carlos? I'm gonna go into uh, Memoir 44. This will be a quick one. Uh, because it's it's just it's a great title. Uh, there was a guy, a gentleman there. It was Veterans Day, and he wanted to play Memoir Forty Four. He was sitting there alone, waiting for someone to show up. So I decided, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and I'm going to help out. And I jumped into a game of Memoir Forty Four. It was one of the first scenarios in the book, so one of the basic scenarios. But at the end of the day, Memoir Forty Four. If you if you are interested in kind of playing a war game, uh, but are not interested in the whole. Th- piece that comes with war gaming like the actual measuring and all that i think memoir 44 is the title for you if you want to know about history mitch i suggest it to you because of your location being near louisiana having the world war ii museum there there's a lot of landing craft stuff there's a lot of invasion here uh it's a great way to teach kids about history uh for me i'm i would rate this game on its own at a bgg7 Right, yeah. but the command and color system, which this game is in within, and you can look at my wall, tons of games for that. Uh, that system to me is one of the best systems created. Like the system itself, I rated a nine, but this game in its rank, I give it a seven. One of your favorite designers, of course, Richard Borg. Yes, so wonderful uh, gentleman. Yeah, I know you. Uh, you really love that command and colors, and you've uh, you've made us love that pen and colors as well no no we, we it's, uh, it's it's an enjoyable system uh, it's i know it's one of the first uh uh, games you introduced me to way back when. Uh, when we you, did a lot of online play back when we would yeah. just sit at home. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I remember playing Memoir at home. That was uh, probably the first digital game I had ever uh, pulled up and played multiplayer online, a uh, digital uh, version of a board game. But uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of fun. Uh, this one's light. This one's, uh, if, you, if you're looking for an introductory war game, uh, a lot of luck in this, of course. There's a lot of dice chucking. And, There's dice and cards, so yeah. it can get swingy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, if somebody gets stuck you can get stuck without the right cards or you can have the right cards and not get the good rolls but yeah you there's possibility you could have neither and if you get neither you can get kind of pinned into a corner and you can't do a whole lot so but that uh, again the other part of that is the games are pretty quick they're pretty light um you can bang one out in less than an hour and then you can play through a whole campaign you know through what five, Which four, I've five done six that. Three, yeah scenarios in a day so uh, it's a lot of fun if you want that uh, that world war ii experience in uh not having to count every tile and uh every you know millimeter and uh, you're not counting beans and bullets in this one. Yeah, you're, exactly. You're just moving stuff, shooting with stuff, rolling and some dice, taking taking ground. And then the uh, the overlord system again. I know we've talked about that before. We don't want to get too deep into that, but that's another whole thing that uh, that just adds another element to this, where you can play what four on four and uh, have a have a good old time with that. Except for when you're, I'm rolling dice, that's that never is going to work. So. You don't want Rob on your side, no, for sure not. What's your number on it, Rob? Oh. Um, I think I'd give uh, Memoir an eight. Um, I know you like some of the heavier ones, um, some of the heavier Which is why it's skewed ones. to me at a seven, yeah. because I've got all the other ones that to me are just push that one down. And I'm the opposite. In these kinds of games, I'd like them a little lighter, a little quicker, uh, and I, I really do enjoy the Command and Colors system, but yeah, this would be one of the top ones for me, some of those more complicated ones. I'll play them, but they're they're probably sixes and sevens, but I'd put Memoir to, at solid eight for me. Yeah. Any desire to play, Mitch? Uh, yeah, you, with you kind of saying it was a more of like an introductory level war game, I, I was intrigued. Watch, I was sitting down watching you play part of that game, and uh, it, it piqued my interest for someone who hasn't done a whole lot of war gaming, that kind of style. 
Yeah, and the, the version Carlos was playing had all the painted. He had all the pewter. Or was it pewter? Pieces? No, no, they were all the plastic oh, ones. The plastic he just painted, painted them all. Those. Oh, okay. They he painted like all his tanks. That... He painted all his infantry, and they're very tiny. Yeah. You know, like 16, 17 millimeter. So, yeah, usually you just have the little plastic bits, and you just throw them out there. And so it's not... It, the version Carlos was playing looked a little more intimidating than than what the game really is. And he but, 3D yeah. printed all the forest and all the oh, mountains yeah. and the hills. It looked nice. Yeah. Yes. Usually it's just little tiles, but it's it's a fun game. It's light. Yeah. All right, we're on to Rob. We're hitting game. So that was game number 25 of the day. <laughs> Woo, this is a marathon. Just ticking them off here. Game after. number 26, anyway. Rob, what do you have? All right, I'm going to go to uh, a game uh, that I was a little bit late to, not as much as some of these other games, but a game that uh, has been well uh, talked about the last uh, probably two years. Yeah, it looks like about two years since it came out, 2020 release. Uh, this one from publisher um, Garp Hill Games, and it's uh, Shim Phillips and S.J. McDonald. A lot of people probably already know what I'm going to get to here. It's Viscounts of the West Kingdom. And this was the last one in the West Kingdom line that I hadn't played. I'd say of the two previous ones, I think Architects of the West Kingdom was previously my favorite. I was pretty sure I, I had seen online some playthroughs of Viscounts, and I had talked to several people in our game group who have played Viscounts, and I was 95% sure that Architects was going to remain my favorite in the series. And now that I've played it, I think I like Viscounts better than I like Architects. I, I got to play Vi Viscounts again. I've only played it the one time. Um, this is uh, here 60 to 90 minutes, one to four players. It's rated as an 8.0 on BGG. Uh, Viscounts was a lot of fun. Uh, what I kept hearing about it is that the symbology, obviously if you played the other games in the West Kingdom series, the symbology is going to be easier. But even if you've played the others, uh, I'd heard a lot of people say that there is some new concepts and some new symbology in this one that are difficult to learn. And again, uh, again with the theme here, me being a little slow on the uptake, it did take me, I think, longer than anybody at the table to pick up the elements of the game. But once we were about halfway through and I started understanding how things worked, um, this one's got some of those combo feelings that uh, that you you can move the place, do a thing, spend a little money, burn a card, uh, gives you some a little bit of extra so that you can make your the ability that you're going to do a little better, um, and then things really just combo up. Not so much in one turn, but there's a lot of what I do this turn is going to affect the next turn. It's going to affect the next turn. Um, the resources in this I found to be fairly tight. Again, I've only played it once, but it seemed like I was a lot of times I was getting the resources I need to do the next thing I I wanted to do and then go get the resources I need to do the next thing I wanted to do and so it was very uh, this to that to this to that it, it made sense to me the sequence of things in my head and so uh, again I, I didn't do very well in this play of the game but I still enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to playing again I want to make some things combo up uh, I know Mi uh, Mitchell uh, took control of that castle pretty early and I got a lot of points by multiplying his people in the castle and he he, uh, uh, he had played once or twice before from what I understand but uh, so I felt like we were a little all behind the eight ball a little bit um, um, for that aspect. But um, I think it was Nick maybe who complained. Somebody had complained that, that or maybe it was William, that that since you knew about the castle thing, that that gave you a big advantage. Although you argued back, and I, I agree that there are a lot of different ways in this game to get points. And so I, I think that the castle part of it is a solid strategy, but I think there are definitely ways that you can not go that route and still do well. There's the set collection with the little... Uh, the little parchments, the little books, I don't know what they call them in the game, but um, you can definitely get some points by collecting the different sets and doing that. Uh, you've got the the deeds that you're trying to flip to make them worth more victory points. You've got the debts that you can uh, flip and, and uh, reduce your negative points. There's a lot going on in this little game, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I'm going to say, again, it's only been one play, and I would have said that Architects for me was about a 7.5 and, and an 8. From the one play, I'm going to put Viscounts at an 8. I, I think uh, it's a game that I definitely, next time it hits the table, if there's a spot, I'm going to be looking to try to, to, to get in on that action. So, But uh, I know you've played it more than I have, Mitchell. What, what are your thoughts on Viscounts? Yeah, so it's a lot of game for a little box. I own this game. Uh, I've only played it a handful of times uh, because it, it was the, the game that has sat on my shelf of shame for the longest. Uh -huh. I picked it up because I'd actually never played a North Kingdom game. Um, and I was like, I need to get on that bandwagon. And this <laughs> one looked coolest because it had the castle piece. But I had no one in my game group that had played it. Mm -hmm. I, I learned best by either someone teaching me or reading the rule book. But the rule book, in my opinion, is not great. So anyway, it had been a few months since I played it. So I did make a couple of rules flubs in the teach. And I do apologize for that again. Yeah, but but um, I enjoy the game. I don't know if Carlos would like it because the theme doesn't really tie the mechanics a lot, in my opinion. Yeah. It's hard for me to say what this game is about. Um, there's a lot going on. I'd agree. The whole thing about 
about the castle, I would say there's three main routes to victory. There's the castle, there's the building, so there's the manuscripts. Manuscripts. I, I do think that the, the castle is a viable way. It's just the way I usually go toward. But the thing is, if somebody tries to screw you up, they can really screw up your path to victory. So it's, I think, the riskiest one. Whereas with a building, they're not going to stop you placing a building. You know, um, it's a good game. You're balancing good versus evil, and you're accruing debts that you're trying to pay off. Um, it's it's a pretty heavy game. Again, for a little box, it's a game that, in my opinion, is hard to teach and hard to learn. But yeah. once you've got it down, the play rate is very good. But it's like you have to understand the game to understand the play rate. It's almost backwards. Right. Oh, but, wow. Right, right. The play rate, I, I agree 100% that I, I was, when you were explaining, I was looking at that play rate, and I was like, ah, this is not helping me learn this game at all. But once you, you did a couple of rounds and you understood – how that player aid showed you how things progress from one step to the next step to the next step, then it made sense. And it was like, oh, I get it. I understand what that means and what that's saying. And if I get rid of that, it does that. It makes that better. So, yeah, I agree with you, though. It's uh, This this game does have a lot going on. I say the weight here is a 3.45 um, without looking up the other two. I'm going to say this is probably definitely the the heaviest of the three. Not by a whole lot, but... Um, yeah, this one's this one's got a lot going on, and there's uh, again there's just some different mechanics in this one as opposed to the two before it that were similar enough. Um, this one t- took a little bit of a of a left turn, but a lot of fun. I, again, I think it's I think it's my favorite. Yeah, it's a deck builder, but you're not so whenever you play a card, it's going to stay on your board for three rounds. So some of them have abilities that are immediate, some of them have abilities that persist, and some of them have abilities for whenever they drop off your board. So it's kind of a cool way. It's almost like you're building a mini engine that's only going to last for a couple turns. I really like that part of it too. For me, I think I would give it a nine. I'm always willing to play this game. Okay, yeah, real close to what I got. I'd say with another player too, it might be up to a nine for me. Mm-hmm. All right, All right you move on to the next game. Yeah, jump on to the next one. All right, next game I played was On Mars, um, a Lacerda game uh, from Eagle Griffin Games. Um, I did not like this game. Um, it's, <laughs> really? It's, and I'm not afraid of heavy games. This is rated 4.65, very wow, heavy. Wow, yeah. Um, I feel like Lacerda was like, hey, Terraforming Mars made a lot of money. Let me make a super heavy version of it. <laughs> uh, sure. It has some unique mechanics, and none of the mechanics are overly complicated, but there's just so much so there are it's worker placement but also tile laying but also engine building but also tech tree it's like everything just he, he mixed them all up in a bag and pulled out some random mechanics um so i'll talk about some of the unique things um so there are worker placement actions in space and on mars and early on in the game every turn you can choose to switch between space and mars but then later on the you actually carlos you would like this is very thematic later on as the colony becomes more self-sufficient the transport ship doesn't have to come to mars as often so you have to wait more turns to go back and forth. There are some other ways that you can supersede that and get around it um, to, to go sooner, but it kind of takes an action. And that's also how you reset your workers. The way that the guy who was teaching me was like, oh, the ship's coming. That's your boss. All the workers want to come back and make sure they're doing what they're, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and I thought of Carlos every time he would say that, oh, the boss is coming. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it, it would help me remember it, though. Oh, the boss is coming. The workers are coming back to their living quarters. Um, lots of different ways to get points. Um as the as you get certain sets of resources created on the board it's the colony would level up essentially and then things would change so you could get more colonists that would come in and you could do more things um and then you also have these technologies that kind of reminded me of clash of cultures but in a different way not everybody is going to have the same tech tree you buy a technology and it starts off on level one but then throughout the game you can upgrade it and then it becomes a multiplier so now you can do that but you can do it multiple times. But you could use other people's technologies, but then they would get some type of benefit if you use theirs. Um, and I haven't even scratched the surface of the mechanics of the game, but I think that's enough. Um, if this game were maybe three different games, I would enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> there are some cool mechanics. I would probably, and you're going to make fun of me for going to extremes, I think I'm going to have to give it a, a two. Wow. Way too much going on. Hmm. And that's against the grain. I know it's got a great rating on on BGG, yeah. but it just wasn't for me. Okay, all right. And you spent how long playing that game? Okay, this is listed as an uh, 150 <laughs> minutes. It was definitely more than that. We were only at three players. Mm. However long, I would say probably four hours with the teach. It wasn't quite as long as your Clash of Cultures game. No. I know because you guys started. Yeah. I, I taught this, I learned it, and I was done, and y'all were still going. People were passing by, going to the bathroom, like, oh, you guys finished Clash of Culture? I'm like, no, we're like halfway done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. 
And so toward the end of this game, actually, I was so ready to be done with it. Like, I was doing things that were suboptimal, but I knew that they would p- push one of the in-game conditions just because I wanted it to be over with. Yeah. Okay. So so what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing here is what they were hoping to capitalize on is Matt Damon of the Martian Matt Damon. But what they got <laughs> was Matt Damon of, you know, Brothers Grimm Matt Damon, like just poor quality movie. That's a good way to put it. Now, now it's produced very well. It's got some cool meeples. And again, Carlos, I think you would enjoy the theme, but uh, there's just too much going on for me. Thanks for watching the Beans and Dice podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 